Uh, you know, this magnificent building was not exactly built for microphones. Uh, you know, I, I guess we, we should have, like, polished our oratory skills and, and, you know, just spoken without microphone. But this is much better, I think. Um, so, welcome back. Uh, warm welcome to all of you here in the Sheldonian, as well as those who are joining us at Rhodes House and around the world. Uh, for this uh, concluding session of our 120th uh, anniversary programming, which will focus on the future uh, and issues that we engage with as we think about the next 120 years uh, of, the, of the Rhodes Scholarship. Um, I did want to start by recognizing the fact that there are a lot of scholars and residents in the Sheldonia. We're so pleased to see you all here. Yep. Um, And also to say that we've had some incredible scholar uh, volunteers and leaders as a part of this, uh, this whole reunion. And I, I did want to give a shout out. I have no idea if they're here, but um, uh, we were, I especially wanted to give uh, a shout out to Kenza Wilkes uh, from Bermuda. Is he here? Um, Kenza's Bermuda and Balliol 2021, and Mizba Reshi, India and in Somerville 2021. <laughs> they, they have worked incredibly hard on, uh, on the kind of scholar programming, as well as the, the volunteer efforts that they have, um, they have put throughout the, the time that we have been together. Um, also want to just take a moment to welcome our chancellor, uh, Lord Patton of Barnes, uh, we're really delighted to have you here. Although he refused to sit in his chair, I was, I was, I was kind of disappointed that we couldn't we couldn't talk him into that. So we are all in for a treat in this next session. Um, it's my great pleasure to, uh, very briefly, but to introduce because I could I could spend a long time introducing Michael, but to introduce Michael Sandel, Massachusetts and Balliol, 1975. Michael is the Anne T. and Robert M. Bass Professor of Political Theory at Harvard University, where his course, Justice, has not only engaged generations of Harvard undergraduates and broadened their thinking and, uh, and you know, sparked their imagination, but has also been viewed by tens of millions of people around the world. Basically, everyone else who studied philosophy at Oxford is thinking, wow, I've never done anything that's been, you know, viewed by tens of millions of people. But it's, I just, I love how Michael has taken his, uh, his philosophical training and brought it to the public sphere in a way that goes back to some of the early roots of philosophy as a, as a civic activity uh, that engages, uh, engages the broader community. And he is also the author of, I think, I may have lost count, 12 books, um, including Liberalism and the Limits of Justice, What Money Can't Buy, The Moral Limits of Markets, Democracy's Discontent, and a book that is quite relevant to the session he'll be leading with us, with all of us, uh, this afternoon, The Tyranny of Merit. So please join me in welcoming Professor Michael Sandel. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that generous introduction. Thank you all for being here. We are having a debate in, in the round because this is not a lecture, really. It's a kind of a forum. And Elizabeth, you've given me a daunting assignment to lead a debate about meritocracy in a theater full of Rhodes Scholars. <laughs> It's a bit like asking the Argentine championship football team whether they approve of the World Cup. <laughs> it's also, ours is an intergenerational dialogue, yet another aspect of the challenge and the opportunity. We have a large cohort of scholars in residence. They're young, vigorous, idealistic. And we have us Rhodes alums. How shall I describe us? 
Not ancient, no. Seasoned, how about that? Now, to think through the question of meritocracy requires us to think through a fundamental question of justice. Who deserves what and why? How should the good things in life, how should income and wealth, but also power and opportunity, honor, recognition, and social esteem, how should they be, be distributed? We'll come to that, but first, I'd like to put to you a question about who should govern. In the mid-19th century, the philosopher John Stuart Mill had a proposal about who should govern, who should have the right to vote. He favored universal suffrage for women as well as men. He thought everyone in a democracy should be able to vote. But he also thought it was important that those who were well-educated have the greatest influence. And so he proposed a system of plural voting. The number of votes a citizen received would depend on how well-educated that person was. So, for example, an unskilled laborer should get a vote, one vote, a skilled laborer, two, a supervisor, three, a trader or a farmer, four, professionals, lawyers, physicians, members of the clergy, they should get five or six, and graduates of universities, those with degrees, should get at least six, maybe seven. Because Mill thought it was important that we be governed by those with the greatest knowledge and understanding of public affairs. Imagine how many votes he would have given Rhodes Scholars. <laughs> 17, maybe. <laughs> he had a proviso which was that if you didn't have a degree, but if you were very knowledgeable, you should be able to take an exam, an impartially administered exam, and if you did well enough, you too would qualify for the maximum number. I'd like to begin our discussion by seeing what you think of John Stuart Mill's proposal. More votes for the better educated. How many would be in favor of such a system? Raise your hand. I don't see very many hands. Here in the Sheldonian Theater, I see only about three or four hands. How many are opposed? I assume everyone else. All right, now, to begin our discussion, let's hear why. Almost everyone is opposed. What's wrong with John Stuart Mill's scheme? Who will begin our discussion? We'll begin with the scholars in residence. Yes, and tell, tell us your name. We'll bring you a microphone. Oh, there you go. Okay. My name is Jeffrey Fasega, Canadian Prairies and Jesus 2021. Um, and I'd say the problem with it, there's not equal access to education. So people don't have the same opportunities to, to get the maximum number of votes. And therefore, it's wrong to... And therefore, since not everyone has an equal opportunity to get a, a university degree, it would be wrong to give degree holders more votes. That's correct, yeah. And what do you say to Mill's argument, shouldn't we be governed by those who are knowledgeable? I think we should be governed by those who are knowledgeable, but like the specific question about whether you should get more votes than other people when it's an equal access to education, I would say no. Okay, thank you for that. Who else, who else has a view about, about it? Yes, go ahead, please, and tell us your name. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Fionn, Quebec and Exeter 2021. Um, I would also disagree with Mill's proposition on the basis that democracy is supposed to represent the entirety of the people, and the entirety of the people includes people who are more educated and perhaps more knowledgeable, and not that those necessarily always go together, um, and people who are less educated and or potentially less knowledgeable. Um, and so the idea that you can only draw from one stratum of society, and particularly given the access issues Jeff mentioned, um, to, to govern everyone. I think that that falls into maybe dangerous epistocratic territory. Okay, thank you for that. It's Fionni? Fionn. Fionn. Yeah. Thank you, Fionn, for that. So now, Jeff and Fionn have given uh, two reasons to object to Mill's proposal, including the idea that in a democratic society, everyone should be represented, not only the best educated. And Fionn, what do you say to the idea that well-educated people, if they're knowledgeable and if they're concerned about the common good, they can represent everyone? Why not? They can, but they don't always. Um, and they aren't necessarily better equipped to represent everyone um, than other people would be. I mean, we don't get taught in an educational institution how to represent everyone. We get taught ways to critically reason and to critically analyze information, and I think those can be skills that can help us represent everyone, but they're not necessarily inherently trained um, to have that specific function. Okay, thank you for that. Is there anyone here who would like to defend John Stuart Mill's proposal against the arguments we've heard from Fionn and Jeffrey. Anyone? Yes. I think that... <laughs> My name is Mike Williams. I think the difficulty with a qualified franchise is how you draw up the qualifications. It's impossible to draw up qualifications that everyone is going to agree hold with. It, hold it close. It's, it's impossible, just hold it a bit closer, they tell us. It's impossible to come up with a set of qualifications that you're going to get agreement on. It's impossible to come up with a set of qualifications, Mark says, that everyone will agree on. But uh, holding a university degree, can't we? Don't you think that qualifies someone to govern well? There have been experiments in this, and they haven't worked. For example, in Rhodesia, there was a qualified franchise, and it didn't work because of the way it was drawn up. It could have worked, but it didn't. So it doesn't sound like you're offering a robust defense of John Stuart Mill. <laughs> <laughs> I think you need to sit down and think very hard. And right. I, I don't think he's analysis is particularly relevant in the society today. All right, well, let's ask, thank you for that, let's turn to society today and the system of representative government that we have. Now, what proportion of citizens, let's say, in Britain and the US and in most Western European countries hold a university degree? Anyone? Just call it out if you have it's, a, it's around a third, 30 to 35 percent, which means that the vast majority of people do not hold university degrees. Two-thirds to 70 percent or so do not. Now let's look at the educational profile of representative government. What percentage of members of parliament in Britain have a university degree. Hmm? It's, it's close to 90%. Only 11 or 12% in Britain, in, in Britain's parliament, do not have a university degree. In the United States Congress, the pattern is even more pronounced. In the US Senate, 100% are degree holders. Many of them have law degrees besides. And in the US House of Representatives, the People's House, only 5% do not have a university degree. And the numbers are similar in 
most European countries, in Germany, in the Netherlands, it's around 10%. Now, what about this system of representation, the educational profile of members of Congress? Virtually none of our fellow citizens who lack, uh, who are without university degrees, find themselves in national legislative bodies or parliaments. Let's take a vote on this one. How many find this objectionable and how many do not? How many find, find it objectionable? Raise your hand if you do. And how many do not? That's a different vote. Quite a different vote from the first one. Where there, we're here, we're a divided group. Now, let's hear from someone who does not find it objectionable that those without degrees are virtually absent from Parliament and from Congress. Why do you not object? Is there someone who will tell us why? Who will tell us why? Let's go. Are there any of the scholars in residence, some of you voted that it's not objectionable. Who will, who will start us off? Well, suddenly you've turned timid. All right. Tell us. I mean, I guess the fact tell that we're all... Tell us your name. Well, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, Emma us. O'Donnell, Bermuda, and St. Catharines, 2022. Yeah. Um, I guess part of the reason that we're all here is that we believe in the power of education to open our minds and to become, to help us become leaders and help us learn and broaden. And so I guess the reason that I don't personally find it objectionable, although yeah. I will say, when you flip it, the question, the first question was, do you find it objectionable that X amount have degrees? And when you flip it, when you say do you find it objectionable that without degrees are not represented? I guess it does make you think about it separate, differently, but the fact that we're here and the fact that we are trying to push forward and open and broaden ourselves, I guess, says something about what we may hold and values in terms of being a leader and what education can do for leaders. So I guess in terms of, in terms of that sort of using it to, as a, as a pathway to make broader connections, and maybe that's more of a question of whether education is teaching us the right things, but. So uh, it's Emma. Yeah. So Emma, would you go so far as to say it's actually a good thing that most of our elected representatives have degrees, have been to university? Yeah, I would say that in terms of that they can, if they're using what they've learned to critically analyze and using what, what they've learned to help process new information and include people along the way with kindness, then yes, I don't see that as a problem and I don't think it would be a good thing. Yes, what, what do you think? Go ahead, you disagree with Emma. All right. <laughs> I love you Emma, but I disagree. Uh, my name is Serene Singh, Colorado in Christchurch, 2019. I think about the quote from Albert Einstein, which is, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life thinking it's unintelligent. And I think that also applies to credibility, that in the midst of us pursuing what means for us to be knowledgeable and credible and, you know, important in a position of power is actually us missing out on life experience that is more credible, more knowledgeable, more well-informed than potentially any education system or degree could have ever given. And so, so why, why you voted that it was objectionable that those without a degree are virtually absent. And what, what exactly, what do you say to the argument that better educated people should govern. Well, I think I take issue with the definition of education. In our current system, we understand education to be a degree or an understanding of an institution that represents you. 
but I think the modern day education expansiveness is really about experiences and it's the ability to connect with individuals who understand the actual on the ground challenges that our top down officials are trying to solve. I cannot, no matter what education I get, understand the life experience that many of the policies are trying to actually get at solving. Would you, would you say, Serene, that the education you've received and that you are receiving here at Oxford does not equip you to govern? I do believe that the purpose of my unique stance and positionality as a student that has been given this opportunity to study at Oxford has also informed me of the importance of bringing people along in my journey to solving problems. So I don't believe that I single-handedly should hold up the torch and solve the problems of the world, but rather to bring along people that can better inform me and use the networks and connections that I have to actually attack the issues of the world. And one more question, Serene, if I could. Of course. You voted against the current system and you also voted against John Stuart Mill's idea of giving more votes to the well-educated. Correct. Do you see your position as more consistent than the many people in the room who voted against giving uh, plural votes to the educated, but who don't object to the lack of degree holders in Parliament? Well, I think part of the disparity between the first question and the hands in the room and the second and the hands of the room is a little bit of the unique disciplines that us Rhodes Scholars come from and the backgrounds from which we are able to address problems. I do believe that there are certain issues and challenges that must be addressed that an education system that is well integrated and grassroots and on the level of the people that are experiencing whatever those issues might be might actually be bettered because of that person's degree. But I do think that there's many other ways to get life degrees, and it doesn't necessarily have to be through an Oxford education. Great. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Now, who... A lot of, a lot of finger clicks for Serene. Which makes me want to hear from someone who disagrees with Serene. And who disagrees with Serene and would like to offer a reply? Yes. Stand up, if you would, and tell us your name. Does that work? Yes. Okay. Yeah, very good. David Clem, Germany in Hartford, 1995. I would argue that the John Stuart Mill proposal is wrong because if you give multiple votes, votes to those best educated, there's an inherent danger that they govern in their own interest, predominantly. If you give everyone a vote, and then they freely elect those who are best educated to represent them, then you have a control against that danger. And you could argue that the best educated know best, but you protect against them governing their own interest by making sure that regularly there's another vote where everyone can vote and can vote them out of office. No, it's John, is it? David. David. David, I'm sorry. David, would you say that the members of Parliament or the Bundestag or the Congress now disproportionately with university degrees, do you think they resist the temptation to govern in their own interest? I give you that point. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now, who, who, else, who else would like to challenge the argument we've heard that, well, let me sharpen the argument this way. John Stuart Mill would have allowed the well-educated to outvote their less educated fellow citizens by a ratio of six to one. But in Parliament, Many people in this room are okay with a system that allows those with degrees to outvote their fellow citizens without degrees by 10 to 1, 15 to 1 in Congress and in parliaments. So how is it possible to oppose John Stuart Mill's system but not to be worried about the current system 
of representation. What do you think? Here, let, wait, we'll get you a microphone. All right, go ahead, use, use mine. 